Hello, I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. We'll start with a basic layout of the in-game town, and then the history of Berkeley Springs in the Fallout universe. We'll then move on to the history of the real-world city found in Morgan County, West Virginia. In the Fallout universe, Berkeley Springs is in the region known as the Mire, at the foot of the mountains that make up the Savage Divide. The town sits on Highway 107, off of Highway 65 to the east. In the real world, Berkeley Springs sits on the largest highway in the area, West Virginia Route 9, which coincides with US Route 522. But both in game and in real life, locally this highway is known as Washington Street. And just as in the real world, this road is split into South Washington and North Washington Streets when it crosses Fairfax Street. Also mirroring real life, Washington Street is crossed by Market Street to the south of Fairfax Street, and Cacapin Road runs around the town to the northwest meeting Washington Street north of Berkeley Springs State Park. The town has 19 houses, a trailer home, apartments, two hotels, and offices. There are shops, among them a Red Rocket gas station, a bookstore, a clothing store, a gun shop, an appliances dealer, and a pharmacy. Closer inspection of the pharmacy reveals an offer for information on Bar Harbor, Maine, the precursor to Far Harbor in the Fallout universe. There are restaurants including a delicatessen, Graviano's Italian restaurant, and Amelia's Espresso. A couple of service-based businesses, among them a dry cleaner, and a spa. Beyond this there is the farm, a church, and a bus stop. Along with this, the Berkeley Springs Castle looms over the town to the west. This is the first of four real-world inspired landmarks as this structure is based on the real-world Samuel Taylor Suit Cottage, also referred to as the Berkeley Castle construction on which began in 1885. The second real-world inspired landmark is Berkeley Springs State Park. I think this is the first state park I've covered in this series that is a real-world state park, as opposed to Kanawha State Park, which was covered in the Watoga series, which does not exist. In both the real and in-game worlds, Berkeley Springs State Park lies at the heart of town and is the home of the springs for which the town is named. Third up on the list of real-world inspired landmarks is this structure, which appears to be inspired by the country inn in Berkeley Springs. Last on the landmark list is kind of iffy, but I wanted to include it anyway, is these two office buildings just across from the park. These appear to me to be inspired by the real world bank that sits on that spot. The closest neighboring town is Harpers Ferry, just down the hill to the southeast. And the closest river is the Shenandoah Greenbrier River combination to the east. At the west end of town, visitors can find the aptly named Berkeley Springs West, a workshop that, if controlled, provides aluminum, crystal, and lead notes for harvesting. The most recent addition to this town is Bloody Franks, a bloody gloppost mounted atop the roofs of the north end of town. The structures composing this location were added in the Wastelanders update. Outside of town there are a few neighboring locations, so let's cover those starting from the southeast and going clockwise around town. First, there's the bot stop just outside of town where the Enclave has been known to send operatives to commandeer the robots. Next door to this is the Berkeley Springs train station, a former home of the purveyor, until she pulled up stakes and relocated to the Rusty Pick and the Ash Heap. Before the war, Thunder Mountain substation TM-01 provided a link to the Thunder Mountain plant to the northeast. And when vault residents provide the plant with proper maintenance, the substation hums with power once more. Nearby you can find both the Sunday Brothers Cabin and Hawk's Refuge. Both of these locations are intertwined in a story of love, betrayal, and fratricide that I covered in a separate lore video. West of town, on one of the lower levels of the Savage Divide, one can find the Snallygaster-infested Toxic Larry's Meet and Go, and a campground where Larry, the cannibal, once hunted campers. Just north of town lies Big Ma, a sinkhole with a cultist altar at the bottom. With the layout explored, let's get into the in-game history. Berkeley Springs was founded in 1776, the same year the real-world town was founded, but we'll get into that history later. Berkeley Springs was a spa town, and one that was quite popular with the elite of pre-war society. But the earliest dates I could find relating to the town are based on a completely different topic. The story of a Chinese spy. Information gleaned from former Grafton pawn shop owner Flavia Stabo's research into Vault 79 provides us with the Charleston Herald articles, a police report, and Flavia's own musings on the events surrounding the hunt for and killing of supposed spy Shanghai Sally. This story takes a bit of guesswork, but here's what I take away from these documents. The entire story of Shanghai Sally was a cover-up to hide the existence of Vault 79. For those of you who don't want spoilers into Vault 79 and would rather experience the story of the vault unfolding, you can watch my series on the Wastelanders main quest. 
I have to say, though, it would be weird to watch a lore video not looking for spoilers. Anyway, though, let's get into it. As the potential for a nuclear war rose, the United States government was looking for ways to secure the future of the country post-apocalypse. As part of this effort, they constructed Vault 79 to hold the entirety of the nation's gold supply. To that end, the vault was constructed to the north end of what in 2103 is known as the Mire. This vault was secretly constructed and outfitted with the best security available. The contents of Fort Knox were emptied and trucked to the vault in secret. Across the board, cover-ups had to take place to keep all this secret. Everything from secret materials purchases, to falsifying records, to even murdering potential whistleblowers and witnesses. To that end, a local labor leader by the name of Alicia Shea was found dead of a supposed suicide that no one locally believed to be legitimate. A supposed suicide of which the cops took an active role in suppressing the investigation. Shanghai Sally, as the press refers to her, was another such casualty of the vault secrecy. Shanghai Sally seems to have in fact been Sergeant Catherine Montgomery, one of the soldiers assigned to guard the vault during its construction. Though it is gone today, the area around the vault construction site once seems to have had a military base on it, at least a temporary one. Sergeant Montgomery served as the head of the motor pool of this base for a time, and along with other soldiers in her unit, took R&R in Berkeley Springs, where they patronized local bars. In late June of 2072, Montgomery and at least a couple of her colleagues stole $20 million and fled across the country. When it was realized that she had robbed the vault and fled, the government was forced to create a cover-up in order to prevent the leaking of the existence of the vault. They caught up with Montgomery and her compatriots in Las Vegas on July 13th, 2072, at the Ultralux Casino. One of the soldiers was killed by a sniper shot, after which the Las Vegas Police Department stormed the casino. The battle raged with the mobsters of the Ultralux holding their own until the army moved in to assist, using a missile launcher to turn the tide. In the aftermath, Montgomery's co-conspirators were dead, along with at least three mobsters. She was at Robert House's Lucky 38 though, and in the confusion, she is said to have managed to rappel down using sheets and escape the battle. The papers reported the event and unknowingly, unknowingly I think at least, participated in the cover-up. Montgomery's allies were referred to as mobsters in the assault on the casino, a major victory in the war on crime. The day after the article on the events was published, U.S. Army soldier C. Rutkowski walked into the Berkeley Springs Police Station and informed the police that he recognized the supposed Shanghai Sally as his three-week missing girlfriend, U.S. Army Sergeant Catherine Montgomery. Along with Rutkowski's testimony, two citizens of Berkeley Springs claimed to know her true identity, Jay Seymour and Daniel Whitby. Daniel being the man who would go on to ghoulify and post-war Harpers Ferry about a decade hence. From the 13th of July, 2072 to the 17th, Sergeant Montgomery is said to have led the cops on a chase across Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and finally Texas, before she was gunned down in Galveston Harbor, her getaway boat bombarded by a Navy destroyer. Despite having supposedly successfully eluded the police on a nearly 1,500-mile trip across the Southwest, it is claimed that she was finally caught and killed in a way that would decisively leave no evidence of who she truly was. The record of the police interviews on Sergeant Montgomery's true identity were boxed up and sent to the FBI. Her boyfriend, C. Rutkowski, was never heard from again, having supposedly gone home for a family emergency. Catherine Montgomery's records were erased from existence. Over the coming years, the people of Berkeley Springs would have to contend with an endless stream of army military police. Thus, we can glean that the people of Berkeley Springs were caught in the center of the cover-up of Vault 79 and the subsidiary issues that that brought about. Getting back to Berkeley Springs as a spa town, though, we can get a glimpse of the status of the town through the journals of Edna, the proprietor of the beauty spa and salon a business with a don't dead open inside sort of sign on top of it. She started off 2075 with the purchase of a Mr. Handy and named it Beckham. She put it to work in the spa. Honestly, the fact that this wasn't followed by the story of decapitation or incineration is incredible to me, given the usual issues with Mr. Handy robots. But in this case, the major issues for Beckham revolved around using a loofah rather than a pumice scrub and accidentally knocking over a tray of lotions. But the real meaty parts of what the spa terminal entries tell us is that Berkeley Springs was the destination for the upper crust of American society, and that these visiting elites were rude, entitled, and stingy. One customer refused to pay for services rendered following Beckham's loofah mistake. When Edna was forced to raise her prices due to increased costs of operations, her clientele complained that they were being taken advantage of. It claimed that irked Edna as she knew she was serving the mansion-dwelling elite. As she questioned her decision to open the spa in the first place, Edna took out her frustrations on Beckham, programming in a fear of bees, and then sending it off to collect honey for spa treatments from local wild beehives. The 2070s were a difficult decade for the United States, even before the world ended. 
The war on China ground on overseas. While at home, shortages of all supplies cracked the cohesion of society. In June 2077, even the spa town of the wealthy felt the effects of this breakdown. On America's 300th Flag Day, June 14, 2077, the saboteur known as the Appalachian Assassin set a bomb near Berkeley Springs. Luckily, this bomb was defused by Boomer, the Berkeley Springs PD's bomb disposal protectron, before it could detonate. Boomer is still in the area all these years later, lying with a broken leg at the Southern Bell Motel to the east. Two months later, on August 14, 2077, Henrietta Davis began a string of email correspondence with General Atomics customer relations. The family's Miss Nanny robot, purchased the previous September, was attempting to avoid her daughter, Leslie, at all costs. Though she had been specifically purchased to watch the little girl, Chloe, the Miss Nanny, was telling Leslie to go play hide-and-seek and then wouldn't look for her, or, during playtime, would simply tell her to go take a nap. Mrs. Davis spent nine days going back and forth with General Atomics customer relations to be told the following. Her Miss Nanny had a faulty empathy emitter, the records of the purchase needed to commence the repairs were lost, and that the time to recover the records was estimated to be on the order of just under one non-Ilian years. And thank you for being a loyal customer of General Atomics. While the Davis family was dealing with the stymieing effects of corporate bureaucracy, the Carson family was having a very rough time. The Carsons were part of the Free States movement. The Free States movement believed that the government's incompetence and corruption were going to lead to nuclear annihilation, and like other Free Staters, the Carson family built a bunker to survive the coming nuclear war. Also like other Free Staters, the members of the Carson family were being treated like fools and traitors by their fellow citizens. The entire family was banned from receiving medical assistance at the clinic in neighboring Harpers Ferry. Caleb Carson had been trying to spread the word about the coming collapse and was confronted in his home by a pair of men who lectured him about his efforts. Mr. Carson was fed up with the ridicule and attacks and he decided that once the family bunker was complete, he would send his wife Beth and their kids Maddie and Max to keep them safe from their neighbors. As the Carson family was dealing with their crisis, Senator Sam Blackwell, the Tribune of the Working People of Appalachia, had gone missing from the public stage. His strident opposition to the Appalachian Prosperity Act, a ballot measure intended to automate the entire government of Appalachia, had caused Daniel Hornwright, CEO of Hornwright Industrial, and a strong advocate for automation, to send his fixer to frighten Senator Blackwell into hiding. A threat against his daughter led Senator Blackwell to go underground, literally, in his hidden bunker across the highway from Berkeley Springs. Both a Free States member and anti-military industrial complex politician, Senator Blackwell knew more about the total picture of what was coming than most, and thus he wanted to get a warning out to his constituents. He therefore summoned Charleston Herald investigative reporter Quinn Carter out to the bunker for an interview. The first leg of the stop was in Berkeley Springs. The result of this interview, a published article in the Herald, was filled with Senator Blackwell's warnings of the impending end and was capped off of an announcement of his resignation from the office of Senator. The Appalachian Prosperity Act and the special election to replace the Senator who opposed it were both on the ballot of the upcoming vote, scheduled to take place across Appalachia, including in polling places around Berkeley Springs. That vote, originally scheduled to take place on November 2, 2077, never came, as the end of the world preceded it by 10 days. On the morning of Saturday, October 23, 2077, the Great War commenced, destroying the world in a barrage of nuclear weapons launched by the Chinese and Americans. In the immediate aftermath of the bombs, Berkeley Springs was one of the towns lucky enough not to be destroyed, and thus became a refugee site for those displaced across the region. In the Berkeley Springs Pharmacy, a Dr. Barnaby was working a medical triage with a group of nurses. Of the wounded streaming into town, the team tried to help all they could, but according to Dr. Barnaby, quote, We've lost more than we've saved, and there's no end in sight, end quote. Outside the clinic that was guarded by a pair of soldiers, it appears that the citizens of Berkeley Springs attempted to fortify the town. Buses and tractor trailers were moved to block the streets. Walls of timber and corrugated steel were erected, bringing the country in, the neighboring store, and three houses within the walls. On Halloween, an army vertebrate dropped off medical supplies, but according to Dr. Barnaby, they were still low on everything. The backup generators had failed, forcing them to jury-rig automotive fusion cores to keep the equipment going. The nine days of endless work was exhausting Dr. Barnaby and his staff. By November 6th, Berkeley Springs had run out of all medical supplies, and thus they had taken to diverting patients to Harper's Ferry Clinic in Charleston's AVR Medical Center. As the crisis wore on, his staff began to abandon him. November 11th soon became the new low point for the town when proto-raiders swarmed the town, killing the soldiers guarding the clinic and executing a nurse as they stole what little supplies remained. It's telling that when this pharmacy was raided, less than three weeks after the bombs, the raiders left the cash in the safe. They already knew it was worthless. Dr. Barnaby now was alone apart from a single nurse and four patients too weak to travel. By November 14th, they had nursed three of the four into good enough health to travel. 
So, after euthanizing the unlucky fourth patient, the five of them left Berkeley Springs for what they hoped would be better conditions in Charleston. Charleston was similarly swamped with patients, and sadly, we don't know the fate of this small group of survivors from Berkeley Springs. The next few months were consumed by the nuclear winter of 2077 to 2078. I don't know if by the time the snow thawed if there were any residents of Berkeley Springs left. To the southeast, Harper's Ferry had survived the bombs and the nuclear winter, but it was in bad shape. When nearby Vault 94 opened its doors again on October 23rd, 2078, they sent forth ambassadors to invite survivors back to the vault. One of these ambassadors appears to have met their end in the elevator of Edna Spa in Berkeley Springs, but another did make contact with the survivors of Harper's Ferry. Unfortunately for, well, everyone, the Harper's Ferry delegation sent to check out Vault 94 thought they were walking into a trap, and thus battled their way through the purposefully disarmed vault, eventually finding their way to the vault's Garden of Eden creation kit. They fired a minigun into the Gex reactor, causing a meltdown that blasted the area with radiation, and led to the growth of the red vines that have entangled the entirety of the mire, which is why they're everywhere today. To close out the story of the Carson family, the only other record I could find of the Carsons was in their ruined bunker, in the form of Caleb Carson's suicide note. In it, he says that his family is gone. He had nothing left but the comfort that he'd be joining them soon. The kitchen of the bunker is blackened with soot, the door blown off its hinges. Mr. Carson's bones litter the floor, seemingly blown in multiple directions. In the family bedroom, you can find the children's abandoned toys. I believe that for some reason, Mrs. Carson and their children, Maddie and Max, didn't make it to the bunker. Caleb says in his note that he tried to do what he could to help his family and the neighbors, but somehow it all went wrong. He says he wants to yell at Maddie for leaving her toys out and remind Max to put holes in the lid of his firefly jar. Post-war, fireflies are quite large, and I think that if the Carsons had joined the effort to rebuild Harbors Ferry, that the children would have brought the toys with them. Speaking of Harbors Ferry, by the early 2080s, the town was back on its feet thanks to the help of the Free States. Since the bombs, the people of Harpers Ferry had been battling radiation-addled humans known as ghouls. For quite some time, they shot all ghouls on sight. As in these early years, survivors had little understanding of ghouls and didn't even know how ghouls became ghouls. They also didn't know that some of them were not mindless killers, but had retained their sanity. It was in this climate that Daniel Whitby, as previously mentioned, became a sentient ghoul. I've talked about that story though, so if you want to hear it, check out my video on the Dire Chemical Massacre. I bring it up though, as Lucy Harwick, a character in that story, left one of her messages to sentient ghouls to come to the nearby Valley Galleria, where they were attempting to build a society, within Berkeley Springs. As for the people of Harpers Ferry, the town fell in 2086, at least as best as I can tell, to a scorched piece attack. I can't say I understand why Berkeley Springs was never repopulated after the bombs. In truth, it's an ideal location for a settlement, given that it sits on a spring where the water is being filtered through sandstone. The only thing that I can guess is that being that it's on the border of the Savage Divide is more easily accessible by raiders. It is possible that some people were living there at the time of the scorching, but I can find no written record of it. By spring of 2097, Appalachia was a graveyard, apart from the shambling scorched, immune super mutants, feral, and sentient ghouls. It would be five years before another human would walk the streets of Berkeley Springs. In the fall of 2102, the residents of Vault 76 created the Scorch Plague inoculation and killed the Scorch Beast Queen, leaving the Scorch a still dangerous, albeit non-apocalyptic threat. Into this power vacuum came the Wastelanders in 2103. Among these Wastelanders were the murderous, drug-addled, cannibalistic Blood Eagles. On the rooftops of the Beauty Spa and Salon, Amelia's Espresso, and Three Houses, the Blood Eagles constructed Bloody Franks, an outpost that hosted the Blood, the drug-pushing, drug-abusing recruiter of the Blood Eagles, who would take recruits into nearby Hawks Refuge south of town to get high. As part of the purge of the Blood Eagle leadership, Beckett, the former raider, and a vault resident killed the Blood. While the Blood died, it's hard to wipe the stain off a place where they practice culinary cannibalism. And with that, we're up to date on Berkeley Springs and the Fallout universe. On to the real world history. Berkeley Springs is the first city that we've covered that lies in West Virginia's eastern panhandle. It is approximately 34 miles northwest of Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, and approximately 82 miles from the heart of the capital wasteland, Washington, D.C. Interestingly, to me at least, if you draw a line on the map from Berkeley Springs to Washington, D.C., Harpers Ferry falls on that line. The town lies at the eastern foot of Warm Springs Ridge on a stream called Warm Springs Run. Two miles west of town over that ridge lies the Potomac River, with Maryland on the other side. As the Potomac runs north and east in the area, Maryland is also approximately four miles away to the north. Virginia lies about 13 miles south-southwest. The valley in which Berkeley Springs lies is covered in small rural towns, farms, and woods. 
There are two neighboring communities, Jimtown to the north and Berryville to the south, which butt directly up against Berkeley Springs. North of town lies the unincorporated community of Burnt Factory, home to a large quarry where Warm Springs Ridge is slowly being cut away. At the heart of Berkeley Springs lies the Berkeley Springs State Park, the spot at which warm mineral water bubbles up out of the ground. The exact source of both the water and its 74.3 degree temperature, approximately 25 degrees above the usual, are unknown, but it has been suggested that there's a volcanic hotspot under the ground through which the spring water flows, picking up minerals from the region's sandstone. We will discuss the state park more further on, but let's start with the history of the town and the area in which it lies. The pre-European history of the region goes back thousands of years, but due to the climate of the region and the impermanence of many older artifacts, the earliest relics of human settlement, aside from stone arrowheads dating back millennia, are ceramics classified as Clemson Island, dating back from 800 to 1400 AD. The cultures that created these ceramics were followed by those who created pottery classified as the distinctive Kaiser pottery, from 1400 to 1550 AD. Please note that these cultures are not specific tribes or nations, rather the pottery classifications are named for the locations where the artifacts were discovered, or for the archaeologist who originally discovered them. My speculation is this is in part simply because we do not know the names of the groups that created them, but let's keep advancing through history. The first Europeans to explore Virginia were the Spanish, who attempted missions to convert the natives in the late 16th century. They failed in this effort though, leaving the territory open to the British. Around 1600, local cultures were producing pottery classified as Schultz, with triangular and diamond-shaped decorations. But that brings us around to the time of the first successful English colony, Jamestown, founded in Virginia in 1607. Before we fully go into European settlement, though, I want to note that it is believed that the springs upon which Berkeley Springs stand were used by native populations going back thousands of years, with visitors coming from as far north as the St. Lawrence Seaway, as far west as the Great Lakes, and as far south as the Carolinas. The first European settlers entered the area in the 1730s. The first map that noted the springs as medicinal springs was drawn by Peter Jefferson, father of Thomas Jefferson, in the 1740s. Although I will note that Peter Jefferson placed it on the west side of Warm Springs Ridge rather than the proper eastern side, and Warm Springs Run is referred to on this map as Umberston Creek. The springs were visited by a 16-year-old George Washington on March 18, 1748, who noted in his diary, quote, We this day called to see ye famed Warm Springs, end quote. Washington was there on his first commission as a surveyor, working for Thomas Fairfax, 6th Lord Fairfax of Cameron, who employed Washington to survey his lands west of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Washington would visit the springs many times over the years and spread awareness of their existence. In 1776, Lord Fairfax conveyed his land holdings at the spring to the colony of Virginia after which the land was then sold to individuals, with Washington becoming one of the initial purchasers. A new settlement was established December 6, 1776, named Bath, in reference to the city of Bath, England, noted for its Roman baths. The first bathhouses of Berkeley Springs were created by James Rumsey in 1784. Rumsey, a mechanical engineer, is best known for his efforts to make the Potomac navigable and his exhibition of a steamship in 1787. In these early days, Bath seems to have been a somewhat rambunctious place. Visiting Methodist Bishop Francis Ashbury is said to have been horrified by the, quote, overwhelming tide of immorality, end quote, as the town was home for gambling, horse racing, and refereed street fights. Basically, an early American Las Vegas, it seems. Visitors to the springs would both bathe in the water and drink it for its medical benefits. By the end of the 19th century, it was a well-established spa town. This seems to be a good point to discuss the name of Berkeley Springs. As previously stated, it was founded as Bath in 1776. In 1801, as the state of Virginia was setting up its postal system, it seems it was decided that no two towns could have the same name. There was already Bath, Virginia, located in Bath County, and as such, the local post office was named Berkeley Springs. After both the Warm Springs and Norburn Berkeley, 4th Baron Botetot, colonial governor from 1768 to 1770. According to the city's website, Bath is still the official municipal name, in spite of the more commonly used Berkeley Springs. To backtrack slightly in history though, let's discuss the man for whom Morgan County, the county of which Berkeley Springs is the seat, is named. Morgan County is named for Revolutionary War General Daniel Morgan. Daniel Morgan was part of the disastrous Braddock Expedition of 1755, along with future General George Washington. During the expedition, a lieutenant whom he angered struck him with the flat side of a sword. Morgan responded by knocking him out. Though he was sentenced to 500 lashes for this, he claimed to have only received 499. Later in life, he would remark that the British still owed him one. The thing I take away from this, though, is that he survived what is effectively meant to be a death sentence by torture. Moving on to the Revolutionary War, though, 
Those of you who have the movie The Patriot in your memory will remember Mel Gibson's character Benjamin Martin, a character based in part on Daniel Morgan. General Morgan and his men harassed British forces in South Carolina until General Cornwallis sent Colonel Bannister Tarleton's legion after them, Colonel Tarleton having a role in The Patriot played by Jason Isaacs. At the Battle of Cowpens on January 17, 1781, the Continental Army and militia under General Morgan, Andrew Pickens, and William Washington defeated Colonel Tarleton. Though he escaped the battle, Colonel Tarleton lost 940 of his 1,076 men, 110 of whom were killed in action, 830 captured, of whom 200 were wounded. For his victory at the Battle of Cowpens, Virginia gave General Morgan the estate of a loyalist. Daniel Morgan would eventually die on July 6, 1802, on his daughter's farm in Winchester, Virginia, not far south of the West Virginia-Virginia state line. Of course, that line didn't technically exist until 1863. Back to the county name for Daniel Morgan, though. Morgan County has this year been celebrating its bicentennial, having been created from parts of Berkeley and Hampshire counties by the Virginia General Assembly in 1820. The most dense portion of Berkeley Springs history appears to have been in the 18th century, but I did find some insights on its history in the 19th and 20th as well. The population of Berkeley Springs swelled to its greatest extent at 2,982 in time for the 1860 census. On April 4th of the following year, as the state of Virginia was considering secession, Morgan County's representative to the secession convention voted against secession before he voted for it in a second vote on April 17th. On May 23rd, 1861, the issue was put to a popular vote, and Morgan County was one of those that voted against secession. On June 19th, many of the counties that would go on to form West Virginia voted to secede from the Confederate state of Virginia, naming their government the Restored Government of Virginia effectively considering themselves to be a government in exile from the true capital of Richmond. Though Morgan County was not one of those to initially join the Union-supporting counties, over the winter of 1861 to 1862, it, along with five others, joined the newly renamed West Virginia. On June 20th, 1863, two years after its secession from Confederate Virginia, the new state of West Virginia was admitted to the Union. Backtracking slightly, on January 1st, 1862, General Stonewall Jackson led his forces from Winchester, Virginia through Berkeley Springs on his way to assault Hancock, Maryland, just across the Potomac to the north. General Jackson's goal was to disrupt the Union supplies by assaulting the B&O Railroad and Chesapeake, Ohio Canal, both of which moved through Hancock. He reached a hill overlooking the town on January 5th and began to bombard Hancock. The city's Union commander refused to surrender, so Jackson spent the next two days continuing the bombardment while looking for a river crossing. He eventually gave up and withdrew to the southwest. For a reason I cannot specifically determine, the population of Berkeley Springs declined 80% from 2982 to 487 by the 1870 census. The only thing I can guess is that the disruption caused by the Civil War drove people away from the area, likely in part to it lying so close to the border with Virginia. The population grew slowly over the next few decades, reaching 860 by 1910. 1919's Red Summer is an event we discussed back in the video on Beckley, and it has a part to play here too. For those of you who didn't see the video, or simply don't remember, in 1919 veterans of the First World War were returning home from the front looking to get their jobs back. Over the years, southern rural blacks have been migrating into the factory towns of the north, in some cases taking the jobs left behind by the white men who went to the western front. Blacks of course had fought on the western front too, in segregated units. Many of these veterans were coming back having fought for their country, only to be confronted by the poor state of their treatment at home. Add to this growing friction the economic downturn that follows the end of major wars, as government orders drop and industry has to retool to consumer goods. And the fact that big business was in large part using black men as strike breakers, and it's pretty easy to see how this year would become the nadir of American race relations. Morgan County, West Virginia had its own set of race riots set off by a labor dispute. In the midst of these riots, Martinsburg resident Hugh Ferguson, a black man, was accused of criminally assaulting Mrs. Ernest Zimmerman, a white woman, at her home just across the Potomac from Hancock, Maryland. Mr. Ferguson was arrested and transported by Sheriff C.R. Hovermail to the jail in Berkeley Springs. An angry mob of white men surrounded the jail looking to lynch Mr. Ferguson. Sheriff Hovermail managed to escape with Mr. Ferguson to Martinsburg before the angry mob managed to break into the prison. The sheriff was worried that the mob might follow them to Martinsburg, and as such he and Mr. Ferguson snuck onto a B&O railroad train heading west, safely bringing Mr. Ferguson to the Moundsville Penitentiary. Those of you who watched my other lore videos will remember that Moundsville Penitentiary is the inspiration for Eastern Regional Penitentiary, which can be found in the toxic valley of Fallout's Appalachia. Moving on though, the population of Berkeley Springs continued to grow and eventually topped out at 1,213 in time for the 1950 census, before declining to its current estimated population of approximately 600. Although I have to note that I don't know if the neighboring communities of Jimtown and Berryville are counted in that. 
Today, Berkeley Springs is still a spa town, with much of its economy based on tourism and is a vibrant artist community. At the center of town in Berkeley Springs State Park, one of the smallest state parks in the United States, the springs flow for everyone to enjoy. There are several open air bodies of water in the park, including Warm Springs Run, the springs themselves, George Washington's bathtub, and a public pool. The park also contains two bathhouses, the main bathhouse, originally opened in 1930, which offers a modern spa experience using the mineral water from the springs and the Old Roman Bathhouse, circa 1815, which provides the experience to see what the spring was like 200 years ago. On the second floor of the Old Roman Bathhouse, the park has a museum displaying historical artifacts from around the town. Along with the warm springs on which the town was founded, the city offers other recreational opportunities. Ten miles south of town on Warm Spring Ridge, also known locally as Kakapin Mountain, lies Kakapin Resort State Park. I've mentioned the name Kakapin before when speaking about the road that runs around the town to the northwest, and it makes sense that it's used here multiple times, as it's the Shawnee word meaning medicine waters. Kakapin Resort State Park, like Watoga State Park, was constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Great Depression, officially opened July 1, 1937. Much of the park's construction took place during the 1940s. There was a golf course circa 1973, hiking, biking, and horseback riding trails, hunting, camping, fishing, and even geocaching. If you don't want to camp, the park also has a lodge with a restaurant and cabins built in the 1950s. Other than the two state parks though, Berkeley Springs has many hotels, B&Bs, restaurants, festivals, live music, and theater, although many of these events have been cancelled thanks to the pandemic. I think that'll do it for Berkeley Springs though. This has been the Resident Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.